So our actions today will shape the world that our children and grandchildren inherit. We're requesting $10.6 billion to help Israel defend itself. The supplemental also requests $44.4 billion to help Ukraine continue to defend itself against Russia's ongoing aggression. We're also requesting $3.3 billion to meet U.S. military requirements in our submarine industrial base and to fulfill our AUKUS requirements. I'm also deeply committed to working with all of you to enact a full-year appropriation bill to keep America secure. As President Biden has said, American leadership is what holds the world together. And if we fail to lead, the costs and threats to the United States will only grow. We must not give our friends, our rivals, or our foes any reason to doubt America's resolve. This is my video update from Sofia, Bulgaria on this Wednesday afternoon, November the 1st. Let's talk about some news. And uh, an interesting day for the U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken. He was testifying in front of Congress, I believe, actually the Senate. And he was talking about uh, his, his thoughts on the, the war in Israel and in Gaza, as well as uh, conflict, the conflict in Ukraine, Project Ukraine. And Blinken told, according to Bloomberg, he told the U.S. Congress that the plan for Gaza, or one of the plans that they're actually considering, is to move in U.S. and Collective West peacekeepers, U.S., U.K., German, and French peacekeepers into Gaza once the objectives of the war are completed. That's the plan that the Biden White House is actually considering with regards to Gaza. And Blinken told those in attendance listening to him that uh, once this war is over, whatever that will be, once this, this war concludes, Israel cannot uh, secure the, the peace in Gaza. Um, nor should they, according to Blinken, and it puts uh, Israel, Israel's security at risk uh, for the people of, of Gaza. You can't have uh, you can't have Hamas there either. They'll be they'll be eliminated. And so the plan, the idea from the Biden White House, one of the ideas is that you have U.S. and German and U.K. and French peacekeepers move into Gaza and secure secure the peace in Gaza, secure the area in Gaza. Permanent, a permanent U.S. force stationed in Gaza. That's one of the plans, one of the brilliant ideas from Blinken and co. And, uh, and there were protesters there as Blinken was was speaking as he was giving his testimony, as he was testifying in D.C., you had protesters in, uh, in attendance and uh, they, were, they were calling for a ceasefire. They were yelling at Blinken to, uh, to get a ceasefire in Gaza because the situation is getting out of control and things are escalating to a very dangerous level. Yesterday, we had the Houthis in Yemen. They launched uh, missiles towards uh, Israel. And after they launched missiles towards Israel, they declared war on Israel. And um, not such a big deal if it's just the Houthis declaring war on Israel. This is, this is not going to concern the Israeli military. But uh, what worries me is that you've taken one step closer to... Iraqi militias, uh, and then Hezbollah, and then Iran. This is what worries me, is, is that you're, you're, you're getting closer to getting Hezbollah involved in this, and if Hezbollah gets involved in this, 
then that uh, brings in Lebanon and and Iran into this conflict, and then and then all bets are off. Then this thing has become uh, at at a minimum, at a minimum, this has become uh, a regional war, and so that's what worries me about this declaration of war by the uh, by the Houthis in Yemen. And yesterday we had. We had a horrific event at the Jabalia refugee camp. The Israeli military, they bombed a refugee camp. And the reason they gave for bombing this refugee camp is according to statements from the, the IDF is that there was a Hamas commander at this refugee camp. And so they, they thought that the best way to take out one one Hamas commander, maybe there were more than one, but from what I understand, there was one, maybe two, three, I don't know, whatever. Uh, the, the, the best way to, to take out this commander or these commanders that were mixed up, mixed into this, uh, this camp was to, was to launch a missile into this camp. That was, that was the best way to go about this, a uh, refugee camp where you have women and children and, uh, and aid workers as well. You have aid workers at this uh, refugee camp. And so there must have been a hundred, a thousand better ways to eliminate um, a Hamas terrorist rather than sending a missile into a refugee camp with children and, and women and, and aid workers at that camp. And, uh, and you can't spin this like uh, like what happened at the hospital in Gaza, whatever happened there. There's no fog of war around the events of uh, this, this missile strike at this refugee camp. Uh, there still is a lot, of, uh, a lot of question marks and a lot of fog of war surrounding the Gaza hospital uh, missile strike. Uh, there, there hasn't been a proper investigation. I don't think there's been a proper investigation as to what happened there. But uh, with this incident at this refugee camp, I mean, it's, I mean, it's cut and dry what, what happened. I mean, it's obvious. Uh, the Israeli military said that they hit this refugee camp. So there's no way to, to spin this thing. And uh, saying that you hit a refugee camp in order to take out a Hamas commander, one or two guys, I mean, this is, this is reckless and, and excessive. And, and it's going to... It's, it's going to turn off uh, a lot of, uh, of people who, who were supporting uh, Israel or who, or who were understanding uh, what Israel or who were understanding Israel's position in this war. This is going to turn off um, a lot of people. Um, CNN, they read an article and, uh, and they said that uh, Israeli uh, human rights organizations are now condemning the the war in Gaza, Israel's war in Gaza, because of this bombing of this refugee camp. Bolivia, they've cut off their ties with uh, Israel. They've cut off diplomatic uh, relations with Israel over the conflict in Gaza. Once again, if it's just Bolivia, it's not really that big of a deal. But uh, you have to, if you're Israel and you're the United States, you know, you have to be asking yourself, is, is, is this going to lead to more countries uh, cutting off ties with Israel? Is, is, is this going to lead to, to uh, Israel and the United States, by extension, becoming isolated? with regards to, to this war. I mean, today it's Bolivia, tomorrow it's another country and another and another, and, and maybe, probably not. This is probably a, a one-off, but you know, you have to be concerned if you're, if you're the United States or Israel at, at this bombing of this refugee camp and, and the, the reaction and the responses from, the, from various groups and countries and aid organizations um, about this, this bombing of this refugee camp. So I, 
I don't understand what Israel gained from, from this, to be quite honest. And uh, the, the correct course of action, if you are the Israeli military, is to come out with a statement and, uh, and apologize and to then say that you're going to conduct an investigation and you're going to, uh, to hold the individuals uh, accountable, that greenlit this strike on this refugee camp. That would be the, the correct thing to, to do. But I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. Lavrov was meeting with his counterpart, the Syrian foreign minister, and uh, Lavrov said that uh, there should there should be no more strikes into Syria. He warned the Israeli military not to uh, not to attack Syria. That is coming from the Russian foreign minister. Lavrov brought up the issue of Israeli attacks, which have become more fre frequent against the backdrop of events around Gaza around the Gaza Strip during a phone call with Syrian Foreign Minister Falsai Makdad, the Russian Foreign Ministry said in a readout of the call, both ministers emphasized the danger of attempts by external forces to turn the Middle East in its current explosive situation into an arena for settling geopolitical scores, the readout said. Lavrov said that striking Syria is unacceptable so that is a statement from the russian foreign ministry and in the united states we have the fbi director christopher ray he is warning that we could have terrorist attacks in the united states and uh and these terror attacks are a consequence of the, the war in Israel. And this should be very concerning to, uh, to many Americans, but to everybody around the world, because you could have a terror incident take place in the United States, or you could have a, a false flag incident take place in the United States. And... And both of these, uh, both of these things, could easily draw the U.S. into into the conflict in the Middle East and into a conflict with Iran. Because if there were to be some sort of uh, terror attack in the United States or a false flag in the United States, you know that Iran will uh, will be blamed for such a thing, and and then you end up in in a wider uh, world war. So you have the warning now from Christopher Ray. Biden's approval numbers with Arab Americans, they are sinking over the Biden White House is support, no red line support of Israel. And we are starting to see that this is affecting Biden during uh, a campaign uh, season and election season for 2024, he is losing support from Arab Americans. A poll from AAI shows an increase in discrimination against Arab Americans and increase in support for Donald Trump is according to this poll and this article from The Guardian. I don't see why Arab Americans would be supporting Trump because I don't think Trump's position is that much different than Biden's. What Trump should do is that he should say that he will not escalate with Iran and he will not take the United States into a world war. That should be what what's Trump's messaging is, but uh, we're not getting that. We're actually getting Trump pretty much um, aligned with uh, the Biden White House's messaging with regards to this this war in uh, in Israel. And the Biden White House also said that they will veto the 
the House is proposal to provide 14, 15 billion in aid to Israel because the House is not including money to Ukraine in this package. And Lloyd Austin, he was speaking to to the Senate, to Congress, along with uh, with Blinken. Lloyd Austin was there, and Lloyd Austin also made the case for money to Ukraine. He said that Ukraine should get 44 billion in uh, military and financial aid. And Lloyd Austin said, if Ukraine doesn't get the money, and I quote, I can guarantee, this is what Lloyd Austin said, I can guarantee that without our support, Putin will be successful. If we pull the rug out from under them now, Putin will only get stronger and he will be successful in doing what he wants to do. So that is coming from Lloyd Austin. So Biden is going to veto the 14, 15, 15 billion in aid to Israel because he is pushing for money to go to, to Ukraine as well. And you have Lloyd Austin making the case to the Senate that uh, 44 billion should get allocated to Ukraine. And money's gonna go to, uh, to Ukraine, no doubt about it. All of this is just theater. Lloyd Austin, Blinken, their appearance in front of uh, the Senate and in front of Congress, it's just all theater. Money will be given to, uh, to Ukraine, that's a definite. How much money will be given, who knows, but we had 61 billion, now Austin is talking about 44 billion, who knows what the amount is going to be, this is uh, St. Nicholas Church here in Sofia, Bulgaria right downtown in Sofia is this church. So I think I can walk up closer and get a better look. So yeah, money's gonna go to Ukraine. We just don't know the amount. Maybe it will be 44 billion, 40 billion, who knows? But uh, all of these, uh, all of these hearings and having Austin and Blinking testify in front of the Senate, it's just all theater. Just approve the money and get it over with. <laughs> That's what I say, just get it over with. and Give the money to Ukraine, it's not gonna make any difference. It's not gonna make any difference whatsoever. All it's going to do is prolong, as the Russians say, it's just gonna prolong the agony. That's what Putin said. It's just gonna prolong the agony. And now, and now from, uh, from what Time Magazine reported yesterday, it should be very clear to everybody that uh, there is no way for Ukraine to win this conflict. And Viktor Orban, he said it as well a couple of days ago, Ukraine is not gonna win this war. Russia will not be defeated. So whatever money is given to Ukraine, it's just gonna prolong the agony. It's just all part of the, the grift, but uh, stop stop wasting taxpayer money with these hearings it's all a show give the money and and uh let's move on anyway uh let's go back to blinken we'll make this we'll make this video a short video blinken is going to feature in our clown world so oh before we get to blinken let's do a pre-clown world since I was talking about the Time Magazine article, we have, uh, we have news that, let's see. Oh, there's a, actually there's a statue of Pushkin right, right over there. So let's, let's check that out before it gets dark here. So there are reports that the, the chief of staff of Alensky 
Mr. Andre Yermak, that when the Time Magazine article came out, he was very excited and he posted a link to the Time Magazine article on social media, on uh, Telegram and Twitter X. And uh, he posted a link and he was happy about the media exposure, the interview from Time Magazine. And uh, he didn't read the article. <laughs> he didn't read the, art read the article, which was a takedown of Alensky. I mean, this article, this article demolished Alensky. Called him delusional, messianic. The article said that Ukraine is not going to win the conflict. It can't win the conflict. Uh, Alensky is, is the only one in the entirety of uh, the Ukraine government and the Ukraine administration that actually is clinging on to a belief that Ukraine can win this war. And that is what Time, uh, that is what Time magazine wrote in their article. And uh, Yermak actually tweeted about this article because he was proud of it, but he didn't read the article. And when he found out about uh, what the article actually said about Alensky and Ukraine and the conflict of the war, he deleted the, uh, the link to the article. He deleted the tweet and the Telegram post. <laughs> oh, boy. On his Telegram account. So I don't know if he posted it on Twitter, but on his Telegram, he shared it. He shared a link to the 3,700-word Time report on Monday, describing it as a very important article, according to screenshots shared by Ukrainian and Russian journalists. Some commentators have suggested that whoever posted the link had failed to read the article first and had assumed it was complimentary of Alensky, the office of the chief of staff, Andrei Yermak. <laughs> oh boy, what a bunch of clowns. The Alensky administration, what a bunch of clowns. So uh, let's go back to Blinken. And that was our pre-clown world. Blinken will be our clown world. So yesterday was Halloween. And uh, the White House had a Halloween celebration, I guess. And Biden didn't dress up as anything. Uh, Dr. Jill, she uh, she dressed up as a cat. <laughs> but uh, but Blinken, Blinken was there with his with his two young children, and Pushkin, seventeen ninety nine, eighteen thirty seven. So Blinken was uh, was at this event with his children, and uh, his. His daughter was dressed up, this is Halloween, young kids. His daughter was dressed up in the colors of Ukraine. And his little son was dressed up as Alensky. Can't make this stuff up. Let me just read you uh, from RT about this, uh, this Halloween trick-or-treat event at the White House. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken raised quite a few eyebrows on Monday after choosing to dress his kids up in pro-Ukrainian costumes to attend President Joe Biden's traditional White House Halloween party on Monday. While the senior diplomat and his wife attended without any special outfits, they dressed their son in a green sweatshirt and khaki pants, nearly identical to those often worn by Ukrainian President Alensky. Their daughter, meanwhile, was dressed in a blue dress with a yellow shawl, apparently meant to resemble a Ukrainian flag. President Joe Biden, who handed out candy to children, was also without a costume. First Lady Jill Biden, however, was dressed as a cat. Dr. Jill Biden dressed as a cat. <laughs> so, Oh boy, they blinking, 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 blinking. Dressed his son up as Olensky. So his his little boy can trick or treat, can beg for candy dressed as Olensky. Blinken didn't really think through the 
the costume, did he? He really didn't think it through. There were posts on uh, Twitter X, like this one, dressing up like Zelensky and going door to door to beg for handouts is pretty fitting. Oh boy. Yeah, a lot of tweets like that. A lot of tweets along those lines. Eh, give me candy. <laughs> Maybe give me $2 billion. <laughs> I want to buy a home. <laughs> oh, man, Blinken. Man, oh man, Blinken. Anyway, that's the video, everybody. The Duran.locals.com. We are on Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rumble, Rockfin, and Twitter X. And go to the Duran shop, 20% off. Use the code the Duran 20 